Good morning, everyone. If we could ask for the music to be, there we are. So good morning, my name is Darla Hanley. I am the Dean of the Professional Education Division here at Berkeley, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Fall Music Education Symposium, including those of you who are jo joining us via live stream. We have a beautiful schedule planned today with wonderful speakers, a, an incredible panel of alums and practitioners who are going to provide you with insights, illustrate best practices, and showcase the power of music education. Today, through the lens of songwriting, I wish you a day filled with engaging pedagogical expressions and meaningful interactions with others. We all know that music is universal, it's personal, and it's part of the human experience. It changes those who make it as well as those who have the opportunity to experience the offerings of others. Further, and perhaps most importantly today, it changes the lives of the teachers, those who are crafting learning experiences and guiding young musicians. This symposium is meant to inspire you, to challenge you to think in new ways, and engage you with opportunities to ask questions and participate. This is your day to be with us at Berkeley or to come back and join us alums at Berkeley. We are very happy that you are here. I hope everyone leaves with a new song in your heart as you reflect on your own work and approach the art of songwriting with students. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge our fine faculty and Please help me shower the Chair of Music Education with appreciation and acknowledgement. Dr. Cecil Adderley, please come to the stage. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and have all of you here. People will be coming in throughout um, the morning, and it's great to have um, two of our former students as part of this symposium, uh, as well as some other students who are now uh, continuing their career, the people who host some of our student teachers, and Anthony Beatrice, who've opened up, as well as uh, Myron Parker Brass, who was in the position before, have opened up a lot of the classrooms for our observations as student teachers. We welcome each and every one of you here. We hope that you enjoy your time here. P please feel free to ask questions, interact as we learn together. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to Libby Allison. Good morning, everybody. And you know what would be really awesome? You know what I'm going to ask you to do, right? Thank you. Would you? Thank you. We do, we're going to have students who are kind of in and out but I think you folks are here for the, uh, for the whole shebang. Thank you so much, that's great. That just makes it feel a little more friendly. I'm really happy that so many of you are here and um, I'm not going to talk at all. I am just going to introduce our very first presenter uh, who I had the privilege of working with in Guadalajara last summer. It was one of the highlights of my teaching was to work with such a fine performer, musician, and great teacher who we di I did not know. We met at 7 o'clock in the morning um, <laughs> in the middle of, um, I don't know exactly where we were, in the mountains somewhere, staying at someone's house, complete with scorpions. It was, <laughs> it was an interesting adventure, but it was great um, teaching, and this is a wonderful teacher, and uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy Maria Kowalski. Good morning, everybody. Libby kind of blew my first anecdote, which was about the scorpion. Yeah, so I met Libby uh, last June in Guadalajara at seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, I, you know, Libby, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know her. She is 
wonderfully sweet, incredible teacher, so loving. And one morning we wake up and Libby said, you know, guys, I think I saw a scorpion in my bedroom last night. We were like, what did you do? She's like, I went to bed. <laughs> and so my first uh, word of advice is, if you don't have Libby on your like desert island team, you should think about that. Because <laughs> Libby's the kind of person who's going to say, there's a scorpion. I'm going to deal with this tomorrow. Not afraid. Not afraid. So I... I'm new to PowerPoint, so I know that sounds ridiculous. I was telling Mark this. I'm like, PowerPoint? That's why we've got a whiteboard. I'm, I'm a little more analog, so I'll be kind of hopping over there in a second. But, all right, thus far it's a success. My name's Maria. I'm living in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm a Berkeley alum, 2012. And I do some stuff with Berkeley still, so that's how I met Libby. I work for Berkeley Latino, Berkeley City Music, travel a little bit and do clinics in other countries. And in New York, I work for two nonprofit organizations. One is Midorian Friends and the other is the Noel Pointer Foundation. Both of these foundations bring professional musicians into the public schools to give supplemental music classes. My instrument is the violin. So most of these classes are uh, group violin classes in public schools that don't have access to a ton of music education. I um, also teach private lessons, and I am also a performer. So as a teacher, I'm more in the teaching artist side of things. I teach in the schools a couple times a week, but I also do a decent amount of performing, things like theater and TV and things like that, so mostly string section work. Um, why I teach. So I came to Berkeley for violin performance. And my mom is a violin teacher, and I always saw myself as more of a performer. So I didn't even meet Libby until after Berkeley because I didn't really come into my teaching own until the end of college. I kind of went through college thinking I want to be a performer and I enjoy teaching, but that's not, you know, where I'm heading. And over the course of the last decade, through a decent amount of teaching and just exploration, teaching has become such a passion of mine and I have found so much joy in giving, you know, the gift of music, facilitating the gift of music with kids and watching them create and it's really become a super important part of my life and I feel like to avoid being trite, especially at this time in our country, it's really important to empower kids with a sense of choice, agency, creativity, um, and so I just feel like it's a really important time for us to be teaching music. Um, oh, does anyone have a category for introductions? So there's enough of us that I might do like a little introduction thing like I do in my classes. I feel like it's fun to get to know everybody's name, but also to know something about you. So my favorite introduction category is what is your favorite song? Because in with songwriting, I feel like it's cool to get the temperature of the room as to what people are listening to, what they're into before you kind of launch into songwriting so you have some context. So we'll just do it really quickly. Um, my name's Maria. My favorite song is Halo by Beyonce. Um, so if you don't mind, let's just go around really quickly, say our name, say our favorite song, just get to know each other. Can we start over here? Sure. My name's Dan, and uh, I guess uh, Stand By Me by Tony Payne. Ooh, nice. Um, Tony, my favorite song is General by the Band Dispatch. Uh, my name is David, and I, one of my favorite songs is I Wish I Knew How It Feel to Be Free um, by uh, Nina Simone. Okay. <clears throat> my name is Kara. Uh, my favorite song is Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Nice. <laughs> my name is Kendrick, and one of my favorite songs is Taxi by Bob Games. My name is Karen, and uh, I guess Don't Stop Believing. Ooh. <laughs> my name is Amanda. One of my favorite songs is Blue by Johnny Mitchell. I am also Amanda. <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> 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 I hate being asked what my favorite song is. Sorry. It depends on yes. time of the day and what I'm wearing and where I am. So I will go with the quote that's hanging at home right now and she used to be mine by Sarah Bareilles. Awesome. I mean, we're good with contextual favorite song. Whatever in the moment, you know, so that's great. Awesome. Good morning. I'm Coriana. Um, I, I'm right with you, Amanda. I really cannot. 
I'm still thinking what is my favorite. I don't have a favorite song. Um, one song that I love, or I'll just gonna say an artist, Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Every song is Stevie Wonder. <laughs> Mark Diaz. Uh, I have no idea what my favorite song is. Um, the first five that came to mind. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It was kind of blue by Miles Davis. I don't know. I mean, the, the, the that works. Songs. Yeah. But, and then let me see. I feel good and great is that faithfulness and like Halo and. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Fish, like most of you. I also don't have a favorite song. Um, Lost with Your Pen, Sean Mendes. Oh, uh, nice, yeah. Hello, my name is Yolanda. Um, I'm with Coriana and Amanda. But I guess I would have to say, with a little help from my friends, yeah. by Joe Cocker. Nice. Yeah. I'm Jake. Uh, one of my favorite songs is Molasses. I'm Erin, I'm also connecting to Amanda, but this week I'm really obsessed with a song called Magic by Ashtabis Cat and my penis. I'm Tom, and my current obsession is this band Lawrence, which is like the fun modern funk uh, group, and they do a uh, song called More. Mm -hmm. so, so, so. Hi, I'm <coughs> to the party, I'm Amy. Hi, Amy. And we're supposed to do favorite songs. Yeah, whatever your favorite song is. Uh, in general, like very early, early Elton John, 1970, 71, there's a song called Seasons Off of Friends soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And lately, I've been into um, a singer-songwriter named Gabe Dixon. I know who Gabe Dixon is. That's cool. Yes. That's very so I cool. I love to discover new people, and so he's one of my new that's awesome. Yeah, yeah well, that's kind of the purpose. So aside from taking the temperature of the room, the reason to ask this question is, especially with kids, I don't know what they're listening to. I, you know, I just heard there's a song called Panini by Lil Nas X. Does anyone know this song named called Panini? Okay, so I did this exercise. Yeah, it's really fun. So I did this exercise the other day with a new class, and one of the kids was like, I like Panini. And I was like, and I listened to it, and the panini is something to the tune of, hey, panini, don't you be a meanie. Uh, I don't remember the rest of it. And I was like, okay, here we go. I'm Now I learned something new, panini. Did you see a video of Lil Nas doing it with um, that famous chef? I forgot his name, from Hell's Kitchen. Gordon oh, Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, he did a video with Lil Nas doing it. See, I'm always glad I asked this question. I, I'm excited for that video. Very cool. Um, so... <clears throat> Yeah, just kind of the, the idea of asking this question also, third, third kind of thing is it makes you, it gives you context for, I have a song that I really like. Okay, so let's start there. Let's start with what we know. I like music, you know, I've got this song I like. Now let's kind of go back from that. Let's unwind that and see if we can end up with a similar, a similar product, a song that you like, you can make that. Um, so I started with, now, a lot of this is in the context of like an instrumental group class, so if it's not applicable to you, or if you want to kind of spitball and think about ways that this could apply more to your class or your situation, just let me know and let's talk about it. Um, I'm starting with building blocks. Something that we start with in my classes is scales, right? So I figure if you can start with pretty much the most basic level, then we'll start to kind of build into the more compositional thing. I'm gonna focus more on the composition as um, aspect of songwriting and then Mark will take over more of the songwriting. So that's kind of our, our crossfade, but just so you know, we're gonna start a little, start with the building blocks. So if you can play a scale, you can compose. How many letters are in the musical alphabet? Anybody, anybody, Mark? Seven, right? So, <laughs> are there H notes? No. Are there I notes? How about a J note, Libby? No. No. There is an H note? <laughs> it was too early for that. Yeah, it was too early. <laughs> Again, teachers always learning. Yes, thank you. All right. <clears throat> are there any I notes? Okay, I'm going to start there from now on. Hey, I know, J notes, J notes. Um, so, how many notes are in an octave? How many legs are on an octopus? Try to put this context into, okay, we're going to be working with this register of notes. Let's, let's get a number on it. Octave, octopus, octagon, 
prefixes or something that I like to focus on, you'll see this kind of come back up. Because if you can contextualize a prefix with a number, then okay, now we're starting to pick out musical words without them being too scary. An octave, a scale is a staircase between two floors with the same letter name. So I'm gonna hop over to the, to the whiteboard here and I'm just gonna project. So, Can you guys come to my class next week? Okay, so um, I'm just going to number one through eight underneath these. So just trying to give people, trying to start with the numbers from the jump, right? Because you'll see, we're going to get into some chords and stuff. I'm trying to just be like, look, it's as easy as that. There are numbers under these nodes, boom. There's no need to overthink this. So we're gonna table that. What's a key signature? What does that have to even do with a scale? Just trying to loosely associate, okay, these, this jumble of accidentals at the beginning has something to do with what you're hearing, it has something to do with the tonality that you're hearing. Um, I don't know if anybody has fun key signature exercises, but the two things I like, somebody taught me this in class for Sharp's Fat Cats Go Down Alleys Eating Burgers. That is the only way I've found to make people care about key signatures. <laughs> fat Cats Go Down Alleys Eating Burgers. The original way it was told to me was Fat Cats Go Down Alleys Eating Bugs. If you really want to upset a class of fourth graders, you can go ahead and say that. Eating bugs? Ew. Don't like it. But yes. <laughs> fat Cats Go Down Alleys Eating Bugs, Burgers, Bagels. Anything that starts with a B. And then we've got bead, grandma's catfish. I always heard greatest common denominator, or greatest common factor, blah, blah, blah. grandma's catfish, for some reason. Really working wonders out there. So, key signature. What does the word improvise mean? What are, when are some times you might improvise? Um, a lot of times comedy comes up for kids. Comedy, or if you didn't prepare your homework, or things like that. What it, let's let's get into the thought of what are some other times you can improvise so that we're not like associating it with something scary. Like I don't know how to play jazz. Um, exercise, play a scale over a chord progression and a key signature. So you know, use your instrument of choice, and I think it just starts to again create that link loosely of. A key signature is not scary. A key signature is just telling us which scale to use. No big deal. Then I try to move that exercise to different keys to be like, okay, just as easy as that. You know the C scale and the D scale. Boom, boom. You hear that tonality shift. No big deal. Okay. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Scales, anything? Okay. <coughs> Moving on. Does anybody know what a chord is? A chord is a stack of notes. Has anyone else thought of a way to explain a chord to a classroom that they like? This is the, what I've come up with, but if anybody... Stack of notes. You like it? What do you, what do you say? I, I always just say it's like more, a bunch of notes at the same time, and sometimes I lean on the piano with my elbow, and I'm like, technically that's a chord! Yes! <laughs> and then you have that one kid with perfect pitch who's like... <laughs> um, does anybody else? have a thought? A lot of the times if you have kids who have played piano or guitar, I'm sure this has happened to you, they, they get it, but if you're a vocalist or like me, a violinist or things like that, kind of like, okay. Um, hey, look, it's my prefixes. They're back. How many notes are in a triad? So I'm always kind of working with triads when I start out with composition because it's easy enough to understand, right? Try it. How many sides on a triangle? How many horns on a triceratops? I was tr typing out triceratops for this, and I was like, this is probably the only time I'm ever gonna write this word. So <laughs> you get those threes, get some dinosaur, bonus dinosaurs. Um, what I've been using is note, skip, note, skip, note. Um, note, skip, note, skip, note. Easy enough, and it's kind of fun to say. So I kind of make the kids say it a couple times. Note, skip, note, skip, note. Will you guys say it with me? Note, skip, note, skip, note. Kind of just bounce along. So you can start anywhere. All of a sudden, we're linking uh, our knowledge of triads with the actual analyzation of the chord as it's going to come up in the composition, right? Trying to just kind of sneak that in there without making it scary. Um, let's build some triads. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I saw all of those Berkeley kids walking up to their 9 a.m. classes. They're up there building triads. They're not as happy about it as we are. <laughs> triads. All right. 
Um, excuse me, sir. Mark, that's your name? Yeah, oh, Mark. Could you could you build me um a triad on the two chord? Yeah? Do I say it? Yeah, can you just say it? Okay. Thank um, you. The two chord in B in C major. In C major. Okay, so we have a D, mm -hmm. we have an F, mm -hmm. we have an A. Lovely. Here in Berkeley, you have C. Oh, Triads, yeah. triceratops. Oh, okay. They're not septeratops. Sep okay, <laughs> can't say that. Septeratops. Triceratops here. Um, yeah, no seventh chords, not yet. We'll get there. I'll throw a seven on a dominant every so often if we're really getting fancy, but you know, we're kind of trying to keep it. So you'll notice that this one doesn't have a minor, major, anything like that. Just trying to get you comfortable with, hey, look, those notes are sitting on top of each other. That's part of the reason I say chord is a stack of notes, because then we're a little bit less confused when we see a stack like that of little notes. So, okay, all of a sudden we're building triads, we're kind of understanding. Um, I sometimes break it down into the actual numbers of the, um, of the chord, the one, three, and the five, but sometimes I find that amount of numbers starts to get a little confusing. So. If we just see three chords and we're note, skip, note, skip, note, and I try not to, to push the analyzation too hard within the chord. Can you think of a quality you have? Are you kind, smart, or funny? Chords also have qualities. The two major qualities are major and minor. Major chords sound happy. Minor chords sound sad. This is something I've been really trying to lean into as far as composition goes, and just in general in teaching, because it's such an easy concept for kids because they don't have all the baggage around, wait a second, I am analyzing a chord. They just hear happy and sad. And if I feel like, you know, one of our jobs as teachers is to like demystify things before they get mystified as they get older. I remember coming to my first Berkeley audition and having to like, you know, uh, find the chord qualities in the audition and I was afraid because I'd never done it before. But the reality is you really can hear that quite easily even if you are a small, small child. Um, I also find it to be fun if you can think of songs that sound happy and sad, if you can kind of see if those, are, those connect with major and minor. Again, like just kind of contextualizing key signature, greater harmonic arc, things like that, but trying to do it as accessibly as possible. So here's some exercises I've come up with to figure out the major and minor thing. Um, red light, green light, fan favorite. Um, does everybody know how red light, green light goes? Okay, just in case there's somebody who doesn't. Um, green light means go ahead and move forward, run if you're outside. If you're not, you know, walk at a leisurely pace. Red light, you're gonna stop. So if you have a piano, if you have an instrument, even just playing a major chord progression, playing a bunch of major chords, and then playing like a, a staccato minor chord, trying to give that idea of, okay, here, here's the difference. We're physically feeling it in our bodies, we're going. Um, the other thing I've come up with is chord sandwiches. Mm. So um, I, found that, uh, I found that for kids who have a little bit of a harder time off the bat just coming up with major or minor, if they can't necessarily hear that, especially in registers, I feel like sometimes in lower registers, kids are like, well, it's minor. Boom. You know, so trying to give them a little bit of context around the chord, I've been doing chord sandwiches. So I'll either do the same chord, same triad, major, minor, major, or minor, major, minor, and be like, what's the meat in the middle of that little sandwich so that they can hear the movement? And that sometimes kind of clears up when they just hear one chord, it clears up kind of that sensation for them, that listening sensation. Does anybody have any thoughts about chords? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you see an alligator, don't forget to scream. If you see a scorpion, be like Libby Allison. <laughs> I don't know if that fits in, but I'll work it out. Don't worry. That's awesome. Thank you. Ooh, that's cool. And it also brings up one of my favorite compositional techniques, the round. Love it, love it. Won't get into that now, but that's just, you know, part two. Um, cool, excellent, thank you. Does anybody else have any thoughts about chords? Chords, chords, chords. Okay, 
We move on to the framework. How do you define progress and what does it mean to make progress? So this is one of those moments that I try to like, let's take this musical concept and put it into the kind of words of your journey, your musical journey. You, progress has a beginning, a middle, and an ending. I used to talk about this in the forms of communication like a sentence. You hear a sentence has a beginning, a sentence has a middle, and a sentence has an ending. But because these kids are kind of embarking on a task that's difficult and it's gonna take time and it's gonna take energy and it's gonna develop in different ways, I try to say, you know, if you have a goal in mind, right, you start with a goal. You think about your goal, and then you do a lot of work <laughs> in the middle, and then at the end, when you've achieved your goal, you have the same sensation at the end that you did at the beginning of, I can achieve this, I've done this, you know? And so, the goal, which is not as poetic, is the one chord for the most part. Let's sandwich this composition with the one chord. Let's sandwich this progression with the one chord. It's your goal in the beginning, and then you develop all this middle stuff to resolve at the end with the goal, the one chord. Um, is the one chord a major or a minor chord? Right now, it's a major chord. Sometimes it's a minor chord. I try to not get too hard into minor scales as the beginning scale of composition until later, but for now, you know, just even mentioning that a one chord could be minor just puts the possibility into the atmosphere. Maybe someday this could all be minor, but let's not bother ourselves with it at the moment. Chord progression creates the harmony of the song. So I feel like kids hear the word harmony, the word melody all the time, just trying to give a little bit of, okay, this is harmony. Let's not get too deep, but that's what this is. That's kind of what we're talking about. <clears throat> when you're finished talking to someone, do you turn around and sprint in the other direction? Probably not. Uh, you finish your conversation. What are some good ways to finish a conversation? Great to see you. Have a great day, ciao bella, whatever. Like you're gonna finish this conversation. You're not just gonna, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with fifth graders that just like, I want my composition to finish on the three chord. Okay, you can do that, but you need to know the rules to break the rules. So try to be like, okay, let's, let's, let's wrap this conversation up. You can hear the resolution. Turns out kids really like the word resolution. I think I, I credit people who are doing awesome work and, making it okay to feel feelings and resolve conflict and stuff like that in schools. Resolution is a word that comes up a lot and that they are familiar with. Awesome. So, say chords need to resolve. We need to go back to the one chord, feel comfortable where we ended. Um, the farewell of this chord progression is called a cadence. I know that's an oversimplification, but you know, cadence is, um, it's a nice word. Kids like the concept. I work a lot with 251. It's just so easy to hear and it just, kind of puts a pin, puts a little dot on the end of a sentence. It's helpful. Um, in the key of C, what are, which chords are two, five, and one? Are they major or minor? So I'm going to hop back over. with Roman numerals just because I feel like that's adding a whole nother level that's kind of also moving forward. So you're going to see a lot of just numbers like this just for simplicity's sake. Okay, let's start with a one chord. Who can build a one chord for me in the key of C? I know everyone can, so I should at least somebody's hand. <laughs> Anybody? How about my favorite student? Oh, hey, yes! C -E -G. My new favorite student. C -E -G. C -E -G. Thank you! Okay, Coriana? Yes. Major or minor? Major. Major! So we're going to say this is C major. Can someone build a five chord for me? It's going to get really fun here. G, B, B. G, B, D. Yeah. How did you find that D? Why isn't it GBC? I went, I, I, am, I projected the chord going up higher in my mind. <laughs> right. I mean, the, the, the scale going higher in my mind. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you have kids that understand two octave scales, yay. But if you don't, that's part of the reason I throw this one on here. Same thing, right? They see the same numbers <laughs> like, OK, you can't count this one twice. Same note. Come back to the D. And then the two, oh, wait a second. 
For our purposes, major or minor? Major. Major. Dominant for some people who like seven chords, but for us, for our purposes, say major. Okay, who can build me a two chord? Two chord, two chord. D, F, and A. D, F, and A. Major or minor? Minor. So. Now we've got at least some notes to associate with the two five one. I also tend to like play songs that have two five ones at the end, just so we can see context, context, context. Hear it, hear it, hear it. Um, even if all you hear is the song's ending, even if the lyrics are what leads you there, let's just start to get that in the ears. Two five one. Let's get picky. No choices. Remember our friend the triad. It's back. Um, okay, so we've got part of this exercise already done. Draw four measures. Treble clef, time signature, key of C, don't need to use sharps or flats. So one, two, five, one is the first four measure um, composition that I start to use. I just find it to be easy. Kids feel like, ooh, I'm doing something crazy because I've got a bunch of chords here. We're getting the cadence, doing the whole thing. So I'm going to throw one chord up here and we're filling in these triads. Again, having kids fill in the triads not sure how many of you guys have tried this already. Sometimes it's tricky because if they have done any composition, they want to see those notes flowing to the right. Stacks of chords, stacks of notes, stacks of notes. Get to this in a second. So throw this one chord on here. Treble clef. And I'm starting with the key of C today. Sometimes I start with G just because the ledger lines get a little funky, as you can imagine. But, um, but for today, um, okay, so now we're going to start to compose a little bit. Even if this is, this probably takes me from the beginning of the semester, I want to say a month. And that's assuming your kids know a scale, right? So. If we get here, I feel like this is a major success by like a month or two months. Um, all right, I'm going to try exercise part two. So we're going to have the same four measures, clef, time signature, chord names on the next line. We're going to leave the measures empty. This is always a challenge. Now we know how to draw triads. Let's draw triads till kingdom come. So we're going to try to leave them empty. We're going to twist our brains back to our notes flow to the right. And we're going to write um, a melody using half notes just from the triad. So note choices. Note choices is the kind of vocab that I try to hit home here because now we're thinking in triads and we just want all those three notes. Choices, pick these notes. So I'm gonna get a little squat in here for a second. Let's write a song. Who knows what a half note is? A bunch of us, right? Yeah, how many beats are in a half note? Two beats. Two beats, yay, okay. Um, now, if I am in four, four, how many beats are in a measure? Four. Four, what type of note gets the beat? Quarter. Quarter, yay. So, we're gonna have how many half notes per measure? Two. Who wants to pick the first note of our song? C. C. What? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. So we got C. <coughs> now these are our choices. This is something I end up saying about 400. These are our choices. You can pick C. You can pick E. You can pick G. Who wants to pick our second half note? Anybody? Yes. G. G. We're moving on to D minor. These are now our choices. These are our choices. Who wants to pick a half note? Anybody? Yes. A. A. Next one? F. F. Ooh. We're over to G major. These are now our choices. G, B, and D. Half note? Anybody? B. B? Love it. A fine note. <laughs> 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 Anybody else? 
All right, I'll pick one. Uh, I pick B. And then pick E and C. Okay, you're writing a song. You're awesome. <laughs> Now that you're a composer, let's get fancy. When someone walks down the street, do they walk like this? <laughs> or do they walk like this? That one. That's right. <laughs> um, trying to make your notes walk to the closest note of the next chord is called voice leading. So I, I struggled with this a little bit. I was like, are we really gonna get into voice leading with like small children? Yes, yes we are, because they get it. If I, when I started doing composition like this, I was getting things with leaps and jumps and all this kind of stuff, and kids would play it and be like, okay, it's cool, but it doesn't sound like the song that I hear on the radio, it doesn't sound. So I was like, okay, let's, let's get into some voice leading. So I'm just gonna erase our last composition. We're gonna do this next exercise. We're gonna write a melody using half notes from the triad that use voice leading to arrive at the next chord. So we're not gonna worry about voice leading within the chord, but we can, it's pretty easy to figure it out from the chords, especially if you keep the context on the top as like a map key. That starts to become our visual, right? So, oh, fun fact, the notes in the chord are called chord tones. We're gonna get into tension, so just setting the stage with chord tones. Chord tones. So, I usually come over here and say, okay, here's a C. In the next chord, what's closest to a C? D. D. Over here in the next chord, oh, well, okay, that didn't work so well, but you see what I'm saying. You can also write more of these and say, okay, we could also do another D. We could come over to E, things like this, just trying to. Sometimes I have little arrows involved. I also use leapfrog, leapfrog analogy. You don't want to have to leapfrog across like five people. You just want to leapfrog across one person. Getting into this voice leading. So back down to here. Ooh. Let's voice lead within chords. Oh, it does, doesn't it? You know what? I'm just going to hope that it's fast. Thank you. I appreciate that. That would have been a whole other kind of morning. All right, so let's say I've got C and E. Can someone voice lead from E to the next chord? Any note that is as close as possible. F. I'm gonna pick A. Any note that's close as possible, I'll pick G. G, nice. Let's pick B. And look, we're back to C. Leave it as a whole note. Now we're starting to understand we're just stepping between these measures, right? Um, I would do this a couple times just to start to get that. Some kids get it right away, some kids it takes time. I would do this a little bit to figure out, okay, let's voice leave between these notes. Can you voice leap between chord tones? Yes, you can. The notes between chord tones are called tensions. Why do you think they're called tensions? This is always an interesting answer. Tension is a, a word that kids for sure know, and they have a lot of varied definitions for it. If we can kind of, uh, you know, put their definition into their head of when you hear some kind of, ugh, in a chord, there's probably a tension. Um, Remember note, skip, note, skip, note? The skips are our tensions. So we're really only working with like the nine and the 11 as far as tensions. And I don't even give them those names because, you know, let's not go all the way there, but let's just call them the skips. Why not? We know those notes. Um, so <coughs> writing a melody with quarter notes, voice lead leading between these chord tones and tensions, um, voice leading between chord tones and tensions. So, I start by doing the whole voice leading within the measure and then voice leading through the song. Once we've got the concept of voice leading, this is all kind of fair game. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Questions? No? Okay. Can I just ask you a question? Oh, yes. You alluded earlier that getting to talking about the triads would be like a month in. Mm -hmm. How often are you seeing, like, do you, is this a once a class week that it's taken a month? Yeah, okay. yeah, so I teach, um, sometimes it's uh, like an hour twice a week, sometimes it's two hours once a week, but that's kind of the amount of time that I have with these students. I'm sure if you have students every day that, you know, 
you could shorten that amount of time. Also, I find that this, this kind of stuff can either be a break or a real challenge. And so I, I think that's also kind of specific to your class. I had one class who loved doing this and we'd spend the whole hour of a two hour class getting into the nitty gritty, getting into this and then moving into the composition and then moving through like a couple different exercises. So instead of covering a concept a day, we'd cover maybe three or four that led into them doing some actual pen to paper composition and they liked that more. If it's more like homework, I imagine it would take longer because I would just, you know, just get into one part so we aren't, you know, bamboozling people with all this theoretical stuff. But yeah, does that kind of answer the question? Okay. Um, okay. Oh, as students get comfortable, let them experiment with ry rhythm and register. Some kids get that register thing right away, right? We talked about octaves before. If you're already into two octave scales, the register thing just kind of pops into place and people start to be able to kind of explore that. That's really exciting for them, I think, because they start to feel like, oh, I'm really making choices, like real choices. I want high notes, I want low notes. Um, we start to lengthen our compositions by adding new chords. So I'm always starting with these four measure